ahead and get started and then the others can file in. So happy Sustainable Gastronomy Day, everyone. It's really great to have you all here. My name is Lindsay Hook. I'm the head of culture and digital marketing at the World Food Forum, which is a movement, a global movement led by youth for youth to transform agri-food systems. So I'm really happy to have everyone here today. We are going to be focusing on food waste specifically, and I am super thrilled to have uh, some fantastic and very unique speakers to really kind of shake up the usual events that you would see from us. So I want our amazing speakers to give just a short intro, uh, your name, where you're from, and just a sentence or two about what you do, and we'll jump right in. So Chef Steven, why don't you start? Hey there, I'm Stephen Goff. I'm from the United States. Uh, I'm a chef that specializes in low food waste cooking and sustainable agriculture. Uh, a lot of things I do are, are based around using the entire animal or plant. Awesome. That's what we like to hear. Okay, Maite, on to you. Hello to everybody. So yes, my name is Maite, Maite Guardiola, and uh, so I'm a, a background hydrologist, soil science, and I'm uh, passionate about composting. That's uh, why we started a company a few years back here in Nairobi, where I'm based and where I live, uh, to bring everybody on board from big and small houses to prepare and dignify uh, organic waste in their houses. Thank you for joining. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, Pri, how about you? Hello everyone, I'm Priyanka. I'm the founder and CEO at The Livering Company. We are a food technology company that's building our technology that's called Charaka. And what Charaka does is it helps replace not only the animal, but also the additives from food by recommending 100% natural plant alternatives. Uh, so that's what we do, started in Chile, but currently based out of Boston and are trying to give this access of technology to all the food manufacturers globally to make food healthy and sustainable. Wow, I can't wait to hear more about that. That's great. Okay, so Stephen, why don't we start with you? I know you're preparing a really unique recipe for us today that highlights using all part of the animal, which I also feel is extremely important. So why don't we start off with how to make your beef heart tartare? And then we are going to kind of um, also pull in Maite and Pri and talk about their experiences and connect everyone. So take it away, Steven. Cool. Uh, so right <laughs> here I have, this is a, a whole beef heart. Uh, heart is to me one of the best organ meats to use. And I, I say that in also knowing that it is not actually an organ, it's a muscle, you know? So, so many people are like, you organs, but like the heart is just a muscle. It's, it's the hardest working muscle in the body. It's constantly pumping. The, the more a piece of meat works, the better it tastes. And, you know, uh, one reason that I like to work with products like this is because I, I acknowledge that we are, we are, we're taking something's life to eat. So if we're going to do that, then we should highlight every single bit of it as best as we possibly can, you know, and really pay tribute to the life it lived, pay tribute to the work the farmer put in the work that the, the producer put in, the butcher, the slaughterhouse, everything, you know? Uh, so I'm gonna start by cleaning it up a little bit. I have a clean one now, but all this fat on the outside, this subcutaneous fat here, I clean all this off from the start. I'll take this a lot of times, I'll either grind it into sausage or burgers, or you can just straight up render it down just for fat to use for cookery in general. Um, so we'll get it a little cleaned up so you can see it. See how we this got that really there. Cool. So Steven, I personally would not know where to go and buy a beef heart. Uh, are there certain, so I obviously you'd be speaking for um, you know the US, but where could a normal consumer purchase one? Uh, I mean, almost any like Latin American market, any Asian store, uh, well, we'll have have these depending. Um, I usually get mine I, from local farms here. I mean, and also like if you're like a farmer's market shopper, no matter what country you're in, I'm pretty sure. I guess I've, I've never really shopped in farmer's markets in other countries, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I always just go and talk to whoever the meat producer is because they have these somewhere that they want to sell. 
and and that's when that's one way I started working with it because I the way that I cook you know most chefs come up with a dish and then go find the things I I like to go find the things and then create the dish or I ask the farmer what can you not sell what can you not get rid of what what is hard for you to get rid of and so that kind of deepens our friendship and also helps build our local agriculture system and make sure they're taken care of and able to sell some of the products they need to sell, you know, because especially in the United States, a lot of times, you know, people don't eat a lot of these parts. So you have to show them how good they are, how good they can be, you know. Absolutely. So in my experience living in Rome and Italy, Romans are very into eating the organs of things. And recently at a restaurant, they had beef heart that they smoked and made into prosciutto. But I'm curious to hear from a cultural perspective from you, Maite, and you, Pri, in the countries that you're from or that you live in, are eating organs more popular? Well, if I go ahead uh, for Spain, uh, the heart, honestly, I'm not sure. I've never eaten before, but we do eat quite a bit of all the intestines uh, and interior uh, organs of the cows, of the porks. I mean, we also prepare prosciutto with like the ham, the jamón, ibérico, or pata negra from Spain. So there's quite a bit of like uh, eating of some of the parts that otherwise perhaps wouldn't be so much eaten. The blood, for example, besides that we can use it as well for composting, uh, can also be very tasty for, for preparing some dishes or to fit up like the sausages that we, las morcillas, that are also prepared in Spain. Yeah. Over to Pri. Uh, me personally, I don't eat animals, so I would not be able to give a lot of personal experience, but I can definitely tell you from what I have seen around in India, uh, uh, not much in Chile. Uh, I don't know how is the food system here, but in India, I do uh, have family who eat uh, organs like liver uh, as one of uh, a very, very popular part. But me personally, sorry, I can't add a lot of uh, info or context here. No worries. I'm really glad you brought that up actually, because I was chatting with Stephen organizing this and I know that he has some incredible ideas on substitutes, even if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, or you don't want to eat organs. Uh, Stephen, would you mind telling us a bit about these substitutes? Yeah, uh, any part of, well, while we're saying, while we're substituting meat products, I mean, any red meat animal works, goat, lamb, lamb I, I really, really love goat tartare, uh, and, and also any, almost any cut. I go for a tougher cut, personally, because I like that you're already mincing it up. So you don't have to worry about it being chewy. You know, it's, it's basically gonna be a meat spread. But so when I'm doing the vegan version of the dish, a lot of times I'll take beets. And so I'll brunoise, AKA like super small dice, uh, raw beets, fermented beets and roasted beets and mix them together and make the chips that you pick it up with will be raw beets, just shaved and shocked in ice water. Uh, and just super herbed out. A lot of times, uh, you know, I always will do a, a vegan aioli. Usually if I do a vegetarian dish, I just go all the way and make it vegan because I'm already halfway there. So why not? Uh, yeah, so beets are my favorite substitute for a tartare meat. Wow, and that's a great way to look my at favorite it. One. Definitely. So what's the next step? So I've got it all cleaned up now. See that? And with all this trim, you know, like I said, this can be sausage. This can be rendered out to become uh, whatever kind of cooking oil you want to use it for, or worst case, roast it and throw it into your stock pot with your bones. You're not wasting. So now we'll go down and slice through. And you can tell me if I need to slow down or speed up because I got every inch of this already prepared and ready to flip out if needed. Sure. So, so go ahead and, and keep chopping, no rush. I'd love to mm -hmm. hear at this point from uh, Maite about what you're doing with compost, uh, what you work on, and what tips you have for people composting at home. And then we'll get into composting animal products. So over to you. Great. So Dudu Dunia, which is the name of our company, which uh, in the heart it means a world of uh, 
organisms of, of little dudus that we call here in Swahili in Kenya. So yeah, we try to encourage and dignify the waste. The way that we do it is we have created these beautiful terracotta pots uh, with different shapes and different formats. So people can find a little space even within their balcony or even if the garden to start putting their, their, their uh, organic waste that they generate in the house. So we provide as well some brown material and we are lucky enough in, in Kenya that the weather is beautiful throughout and we also generate uh, a lot of cocoa, cocoa peat. I mean, uh, the cocoa peat is like this beautiful subproduct of coconut shells, uh, which is great absorbent and a beautiful source of carbon that uh, many years back, they were just being dumped into the roads and not being used, but now there's many young people just transforming it into cocoa peat. So basically we partner up with these cocoa peat producers and we funnel inside some like a dormant bacteria. That way people can really be economizing in the way that they generate their compost. So these browns are really easy to merge with the greens that they might, you know, the peels of this uh, nice um, uh, mango. So they bring together fast and then inside of these pots, uh, because they are clay pots, they, um, they allow the oxygen to come inside and uh, we just advise people how they can do the mixing. And for example, another thing that we do as well is uh, to do little trainings on people. So here, there's uh, people that has gardeners in their houses with big lawns. So we try to encourage them how they can do the composting rather than burning most of the leaves. It's quite a big practice of people burning leaves with little trash that they find around, making really like a problem with other neighbors and like a health problem. So just today, we just came from doing like a, a training with like, I think there were around 20, 20 gardeners. So we try to really tune it down to composting to all sorts of levels in this case, quite practical, seeing how you can do the composting, how you can accelerate it, how can you use almost everything you have in your garden, even some droppings from the different animals to do that. So yeah, we're starting a little movement of uh, trying to say, well, don't put your waste back in a smelly place and transforming in beautiful compost. Like I just brought you a little bit of some ready compost so you can enjoy. That's beautiful. Okay, so your movement sounds absolutely incredible and definitely very needed. So I live in an apartment, but my parents live in a house with a compost pile opportunity. So. Is there, is it a big difference between how we can do compost in cities and outside of the city? What are some first steps on composting if you've never done it before? Well, I mean, I would say the difference because I also live in a small apartment and that's why these little pots with having this cocoa pit, it makes it really efficient and fast for composting, right? So basically try to, if you wanna start within your apartment, it would be better if you try to find somebody that has these nice pots with some of this cocoa pit. But if you don't, uh, or you have more space, I mean, just any brown material that we say rich in carbon, that it could be scraps of paper, leaves that uh, you can pick in your lawn, grass clippings that you find in your lawn, all these ones, you keep keeping them in a the side of your house and just merging like a, People say lasagna because they are in Italy or in a European context. Here we call it chapatis because we have more influence from India. So you make a chapati pile of your browns, which would be these papers and this cocoa pit and in this cardboard chopped, and then your waste. The just ensure if you are in our apartment that you cover it very nice with browns. Otherwise our beautiful fruit flies might come and just uh, come and visit to your <laughs> apartment you might not be happy about. But if you basically do that and are not afraid of experimenting, because at the end of the day, we are also a little bit cooking with the leftovers, right? We are cooking back again, and we are creating a dish that is going to be really available for all the nutrient, I mean, for all the little doodos and our plants that will just absorb it back again and make nutritious food for us as well. Perfect, okay. so. 
I would love to go on to pre now, but I'm going to come back to you, Maite, because I'm really curious on how to compost animal products. So we will come right back to you. It looks like Stephen is still chopping. So I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, please ask Pri to tell us a little about the Live Green Co., what you do, and just jump right in. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Lindsay. So what we do at Live Green Co., like I introduced that we are building a technology company. And as an early stage technology company, it was very, very important for us to show proof of concept of how our technology works. So what we did is in the Chilean market where we started to pilot our technology, we started to make food formulations that are plant only. What I mean plant only is, for example, here is an ice cream. So I don't know if you can see it, but I think yeah, my background is killing it, but yeah, I'll show it to you in a while. But we, for example, what people already love. So people love ice cream. So we started to create a plant only ice cream which is without the milk, without the eggs, without all the additives like anti-freezing agents, anti-caking agents with plant only ingredients. The reason we do that is we, we notice that there is a huge gap in the way even our understanding of plants is very, very low. Today, we have over 450,000 plants that nature has to offer and plant parts, leaves, different parts of a plant itself. And then our understanding as modern science is just less than 1%. So what the industry does is that there are over 5,000 to 7,000 food additives that are used to create different functionalities. That could be emulsification, that could be binding, that could be water retention, so on and so forth. And these are increasing day by day because we have a lot of food that is processed and ultra processed that are either meat or plant-based. And we are looking at how can we now take this revolution to the next level and understand plants to their deepest level and use these ingredients in the most beautiful formulations to create the food that we love without all the nasties. And that's what we do. So the ice cream that we currently have is a plant only ice cream. We call it the world's cleanest ice cream because it mimics and is similar to the experience of enjoying a traditional ice cream but with all the goodness, uh, one from definitely there is a lot of literature around the world not being able to eat the way, if we continue to eat the way we are eating because of resource crunch, climate change and population growth. And as a technology company, we see that by sharing how ingredients can be used differently, which are more sustainable and add to human health and nutrition, um, we are building this technology. And it's about sharing this technology and collaborating with existing players in the market to bring healthy, tasty, and sustainable food uh, to the vast population. So that's what we are doing. So it's not about using one ingredient, shipping it across the world to, to create something, but it's how we can understand the whole plant kingdom and use ingredients more efficiently in efficient formulations. Wow, free. That was incredible. I can tell you've done that pitch before and it sounded amazing. I love that you are taking, you know, the idea of food waste and using so many different plants and really embracing biodiversity and kind of looking at food waste from a science perspective. I think that's definitely, you know, great to have. So speaking of pitches, just to give some background, we got in touch with Pri uh, and her amazing startup through the Extreme Tech Challenge, which is the world's largest startup competition and ecosystem of tech for good kind of companies, very driven by the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals that we hear about so often. So uh, it's really great to be able to collaborate with them and to have you, Pri, and these other amazing speakers on our event. So with that, I would love to go back to Steven and then we'll come back to other speakers. So what's the next step in this recipe that you're making? Uh, I figured you probably wanted to see us make the aioli uh, that, that we dress the yeah. tartare with. So I'm just gonna introduce the ingredients. Uh, we have, these are eggs, some whole, some yolks. There should be a recipe online for you. Two whole, three yolks in, in this, down version, a uh, quarter cup of mustard. I had chipotle mustard on hand. I like to use whole grain mustard, uh, some canola oil, but really any neutral oil works. A uh, quarter cup of cider vinegar, but again, any 
any vinegar will work and even lemon juice I'll use sometimes instead or lime juice, whatever acidic thing I have. Uh, today we're gonna use, besides the canola oil, a little bit of the Sichuan beef tallow. Uh, because again, like when I'm cleaning up animals or breaking down meat, any fat, I grind it, render it, and either use it for cooking or I create oils that we oils and fats that we can use to garnish dishes, things like that. This is some just like scraps of smoked brisket, you know? So it's just like little pieces that we don't have enough to do anything with, but it's gonna add some nice smoke and texture to our mayonnaise. And then at the end, I always hit it with yogurt because we make our own yogurt and creme fraiche. And so the live culture in that will help preserve your aioli. So it can last a lot longer in the fridge, which a lot of people need, especially if you're gonna make, you know, I'll make a quarter or two at a time, even at my house, just, just to have on hand because I don't like pre-prepared things. So we're Absolutely. all gonna go straight really into quick. the blender here. Yeah. Could, while you're putting those into the blender, would you tell us about um, exactly what beef tallow is for those of us that aren't as familiar with all the different parts? Yeah, uh, beef tallow is, it's just rendered beef fat. It's, it's like the lard of beef. Uh, whereas, you know, lard is pork fat. Uh, and, you know, by, by rendered, I mean, a lot of time, I mean, you know, in a big factory, they'll just make a giant vat of all the parts, render it out, cook it down. Uh, and that's how you get it. But to get the most out of it for, for me in a restaurant, I grind it. And then I render it out and then I take those solids and I fold those into something else too. So usually those solids get folded into like a stuffed pasta or, you know, they can get flavored up and, and stuck into things. I will make beef butter, pork butter, chicken butter, whatever, just something we can like spread on toast and it's, you know, delicious. Amazing. And what are some sure. other uses for aioli apart from this? Uh, you know, recipe, if we have that quart in our fridges, what else can we use it with? Uh, I mean, for me, I use, I mean, you can use it, it, you know, it's just mayonnaise. So I use it on sandwiches. Uh, I mean, any, any, anything that needs a little kick. I've even taken it and like, say I'm doing like steamed clams or mussels at the very end, mount it with a little bit of aioli, which is kind of like the French technique of like creating a liaison like they used to do putting uh, like eggs in at the end of a sauce making process. You can't boil after that, you can only simmer, but, but it'll, it'll rich and enrich the broth in your dish. Wow, great. Ooh. All right, so what I do is I let the eggs whip a bit. That's gonna get loud. I'm just gonna go through the process real quick just so they can see or everyone can see right here yeah and then, you know, it's actually surprisingly home, quiet yeah i would we, we almost used the vita prep but that is not surprisingly quiet so with your fat you always want to go in really slow like a slow dribble and again like really you can use any like say you know you're cooking for your family and you just roasted a pork butt or a pork belly or a big beef roast a big beef knuckle whatever all that fat, you can make mayonnaise with it, you know, and then you have something. So while you're doing this, Stephen, I would love to know uh, a little more about your passion for food waste. How did you get into, you know, being such an advocate for not wasting all the parts of the animal and anything else you cook with. I know in the recipe that you shared with us, I saw some kale stems in there. So tell us about sort of the origins of your passion for eliminating food waste. Uh, well, you know, I, I had a troubled youth. And so I spent around a decade homeless hopping freight trains around the United States, uh, doing different things. Um, so I saw the world from the bottom for a moment, like, or, you know, the, the poorest you can be in the United States anyway. And uh, so the whole time, you know, I have tattoos all over me and nowadays that's normal, but, you know, I'm a little older. It wasn't when I first got into cooking. 
And so I think the only place I could work was kitchens, you know, nowhere else to hire me. That that was all over me. And I also got into a lot of trouble as a young man and went to jail. So I have a criminal record. Uh, which to me shouldn't mean that you're not allowed to live in the world anymore, but uh, it, it does sometimes. Um, so anyway, living on the streets, just seeing just seeing the piles of trash, you know, because we would just eat out of dumpsters all the time. That was what we did. That's how you get food. And just seeing that just massive amount of trash. So then when I when I decided that I was, you know, gonna, you know, I was still homeless when I started working at nice restaurants and I used to just wash up in the bathroom and go in and, and prep cook. And I just saw this waste and I was like, you know, that, that's what kind of inspired me to to even become a chef to begin with was to change the way restaurants deal with food you know like so i'd practice all the time as a young cook like what, what can i do with stems what can i do with heads what can i do with hearts you know like all these things that we weren't utilizing to the full capacity you know like any chicken wings or duck wings because it was a fine dining restaurant they were thrown into the stock which is just like super wasteful that's just more that's that's neat you know just the lack of the lack of respect for food and the lives given for us to obtain food kind of brought me to where i am i guess and and you know those years uh being poverty stricken and not having anything to eat you know it's just i just think i just think like the amount of food that get, gets thrown away in restaurants a lot of times it's like a slap in the face of every hungry person on this planet Wow, thank you so much for sharing that inspiring story. That is absolutely incredible. And, you know, congratulations on all, all your success. I know you're opening, a, you know, a new restaurant and it's just an absolutely incredible story and definitely makes a lot of sense why you're so passionate about food waste. And I think everyone could definitely, uh, you know, have a lesson from that and even just wasting less at home, but onwards and upwards with this aioli. <laughs> Cool. So aioli is made. I like mine pretty mustardy. Uh, let's tip it up so you can see. That's that. But I'm gonna pull this over here. So this. This is some of my mise en place, aka the ingredients I'm using to make this recipe come together. This is how it looks like, you know, it's kind of thick. I like it to be a little thicker for a tartare because it's a binder. It's gonna bind these meat cubes together. But if you want it a little thinner, that's fine too. Uh, you know, it's really up to each person's preference. And I mean, the whole, the whole dish is modifiable because mo most of my recipes are just a skeleton. You know, I don't use exact ingredients. I use what we have on hand, you know? So we had farro for an event. So we fried this farro to make it crispy to go in there herb stems because they're so jam-packed with flavor and texture throwing them away that's just disrespectful right there too mustard green stems you know we're in the american south mustard greens are a very popular green and they're also something that's like they're just tender enough and like so many people just waste the stems of like even even chard you know chard collard greens kale all of their stems are delicious and full of texture and pop so I always use those. And then, yeah, that's just some of that meat. Hey, awesome. So uh, before we get to plating, I would love to throw a question uh, over to Pri, just to kind of hear about, you know, your passion of food waste and how that plays a role in your company. And if it is one of the things that inspired you to start it. Sure. So Lindsay, for our company, it's about understanding everything about plants, trying to use them in their most optimum level. So here we have, uh, we always ensure that when we also do a product and our uh, pipeline of formulations, we already see what are our existing formulations that we have and how can the waste or the leftover of one formula or one of the sourced ingredient for a formula go into the next. Uh, to give you an example, uh, what we do is uh, we use a lot of uh, uh, beans and uh, beans and bean flour and uh, uh, chickpeas and a lot of lentils. 
And we ensure that when we source them, we source them and use them in powders. But we try to use similar ingredients in multiple formulations so that it is it, it, like you don't have a lot of wastage involved in the process. The other thing that we do as a company to avoid wastage is in food, when it's packaged food, a lot of the packaging causes waste, like plastic. So what we Offset's are very, very conscious little. about is that we ensure that all our packaging is compostable and recyclable. To give you an example, here is a box that I have. We do not use the plastic film on the box so that when you add a plastic film on a cardboard box, you can't recycle it easily because it's very, very difficult to remove it. So we consciously as a company ensure that we are okay to maintain the damaged box with time because on a shelf it will get damaged. The look and feel will lose it. We will lose a lot of look and feel, but we are okay with that as long as the material can be recycled efficiently with the existing recycling methods. So those are things that we are very, very conscious about uh, while we are uh, building our formulations, pro putting products back into the market. And we also tie up with recycling companies. There's One is called Todos Reciclamos in Chile, where we recycle not what we sold, but we recycle what we produced. So if we produce 10,000 units, we don't wait for the consumer to recycle that amount of waste after the purchase is made. But we recycle it because we know we have created that. So we try to take out an equal amount from, uh, from the world in terms of the resource and trying to put it back into recycling. So that's what we do. Wow, that's really great. And I didn't know that about your packaging and it's really cute too. So I'm glad that you're kind of taking the function and also the form and the beauty all in one place. Thank you so much, Pri. So I'd like to move on to Maite now, um, just to kind of hear about your passion for food waste and you know, if we do have to waste food, at least compost it. Uh, so tell us a bit about your passion for food waste. I think it's, it might be a little bit similar even uh, what Steven was mentioning. Well, for me, uh, one of my other sides of my life is working in humanitarian life, right? So I have visited tons of countries where people really have struggles to really eat properly as well. Right, and I'm, I'm living in a city in Nairobi, which is this amazing city where you really have everything you wish. And, uh, and yeah, just around the corner, you have these piles of food just smelling that nobody wants to see. And then where people even go and try to find food out of it and eat out of it. So I might as well try to say, okay, we can do something better about it. Uh, at least turn in this waste rather than just dumping it in the middle of uh, poor neighborhoods, because now in, I mean, in Nairobi, we have the largest, the largest dumping site of the entire Africa in the middle of a lower area, sort of lower income area. Uh, the dumping site is called Dandura, where people just go there to do their shopping. So while well, preventing that from happening, it was something like, why well, we just don't do something better about it. So with a, another Kenyan friend, we just thought about do those composting worms and bringing people closer to nature, doing composting within their households. So besides what I was talking about, we also sort of try to master, bring these doodos, these beautiful intestines of the world to process this food faster and just bring nutritious, um, you know, like castings <laughs> into the arena. So like this, we can just start putting them in the gardens. Also, if you visit Nairobi, you will see that almost every single corner that there's some soil available, people plant. You have the kale, sukuma wiki, that is almost everywhere. So people do love farming. And it's just this little step, like just transform your waste that is just there, put it into your kale by the sides of the road, by the little corners that you have some soil to avoid the 60% of our waste that we just put it in, in a dump inside. So this is what it started some uh, years back and what really made, made us happy in this. That's amazing and inspiring that where you live, everyone uses every little corner of land to plant something. Mm -hmm. And I have one more quick question for you before we go back to Stephen. So in my experience in the US, in many states, unlike Europe in many places, there's no 
composting, um, you know, just trash for people living at home. There's no kind of organic waste. And so people mix it with their trash. And a lot of people have said to me, oh, well, you know, it biodegrades anyways. Could you tell us a bit about whether or not it actually does biodegrade mixed with trash or do you have to put it by itself? Could you tell us a little bit about how that works? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, well, in fact, there is different, we all will become composed at the end of the day. So no matter what, it's just a matter of time. But yes, I mean, there's different process with composting, right? There's composting that you can do when uh, we call it aerobic composting. Composting that you do because there's oxygen on it, right? You just try to grow some bacteria that they look oxygen and they eat the vegetables and the leaves that you put inside. But then if you mix it with a lot of like plastics and things, you are blocking as well this oxygen to come into your waste. So what it starts happening there is sort of a different type of composting, which is anaerobic without oxygen. And that one just generates really smelly uh, gases and start releasing much more methane. That's why we have this biogas, right? Where do we create biogas? It's basically contain uh, story, I mean, uh, some uh, containers that are closed inside of the cow belly, right? So those create really harmful gases that go to the atmosphere. We all know that they are much more contributing to like warm, like a warm, a <laughs> like a, the, the, the warming of the planet, right? So by doing this aerobic composting, by segregating your waste, you ensure that this waste might be able to be composed aerobically. It's not going to be stuck or pile up with all these different ways, not allowing the oxygen to come inside. So then you are going to prevent for the release of like more uh, harmful gases towards our atmosphere and basically transform it in a different way uh, into compost. Right, in like in the aerobic process, you release a little bit of CO2 to the atmosphere. But on the other hand, you really get a nutritious uh, product that will make your soil to become even more alive, to sequester within the soil much more CO2 that is released as well in the atmosphere. So the balance is really very positive. If you would segregate your waste again and put that waste also for anaerobic composting, but together segregated, right? That you can really take advantage of it. You can also do like uh, plants for biogas because then you just channel that methane to use properly and to burn it back again and to produce energy. The fact if, of mixing, mixing it together with the waste it's just is not useful anymore. It's just it's so complicated because you won't get it oxygen enough to get it composted. You just release this methane. You won't be able to just properly beautify it. And in fact, the organic waste is what is the hindrance for all the other recyclers to really do their job. So if we just put on the side the organic waste, we can compost the organic waste, but we much easier can compost the rest of the stuff. The plastics is better clean up and sort it out, the metals, everything you put there is much easier to just get it to give it another life or to just like process it for being used again. So yeah, I would really would encourage everybody to segregate at least in two bins, organic and then anything that is not organic. That would make a whole lot of difference for everybody else that uh, tries to reuse and, and be more friendly with nature. Thank you. Absolutely. Wow. I mean, I cannot tell you how well you explained that because I followed you the entire time. I can't speak for anyone else, but you explained it really well. It was so clear. Thank you so much. That really clears it up. So now when my friends tell me that you can just put everything together, I can say no. Here's what Maite told me. So thank you so much for clearing that up. Um, and I would love to go back to Stephen to see where we're at in the tartar. Uh... We can go ahead and start mixing. Uh, awesome. So I just, however much you want, here's a nice little scoopy scoop. Always remember that, you know, we're, you're using raw, raw meat. So there's no, there is no salt inherently in there. So just the sauce isn't gonna do it. I like to do a little flake salt. Obviously any salt will work. I do black pepper because I like that a lot. Um, and so then, 
probably about, let's say a cup of that, a cup of the meat. Still a nice big scoop of sauce. Um, then I go ahead, a bunch of stems because I love the texture and flavor that are coming from these, the uh, herb stems and then our mustard green stems and crunchy farro. I just happened to find a little bit of crispy garlic kicking around. So that's gonna go in there, that's nice. And then we'll mix it up, pretty basic mix up. And again, you know, like I like to mix it up to where it's like spreadable on crackers or toast. Sometimes I'll put it in a sandwich, you know, like I'll, I'll either do some kind of beef cutlet and this can almost be my sauce on the sandwich with the cutlet, you know. Uh, we have a sandwich here that I have been messing with. Uh, it's a cone feed beef tongue. And so it's like a katsu sando, like a Japanese katsu sandwich. So we basically make a cutlet with the beef tongue, deep fry that on white bread. And then instead of a sauce, it just gets tartare, uh, but a really, really saucy tartare. And then we go on full on plating. Yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Oh, oh, while oh, you're oh, oh, while oh. you're plating, I have a quick question. I'm I actually, know. Oh, what is that you're adding? Sorry. Uh, I just added a little bit of pickled mustard seeds, ah. uh, literally salt, pepper, sugar, uh, and vinegar and boil them. And then the seeds will plump up and be, they're just nice and poppy. They're almost like caviar. Wow. So maybe it's like the poor man's caviar. I don't know, but it, it has that, that really nice me. poppy <laughs> texture. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so my question for you is, I know a lot of people watching now, watching later, are gonna be um, worried about raw meat consumption. Can you tell us a bit about the food safety of that? Uh, yeah. So a lot of times the I mean, for one, red meat is is one hundred percent okay raw, but I do worry about it. Like the the reason I don't mind serving and eating as much raw meat as I do in my restaurants is because I source it locally and I know it's coming from a trustworthy source. Uh, so yeah, uh, <clears throat> really, with red meat, there there is no worries about eating it raw unless it has been mishandled, which again, when it's coming from some giant like ConAgra type corporation, you know, just a, a giant corporate entity, there was less oversight than love put into it. That's my take on it anyway. Absolutely. Okay, that's great. That's really great to know. Um, I'm going to give you two options. So just like with these are just thrift store plates. These are, I, you know, I, I shop through thrift stores to find plates there because not only am I trying to minimize food waste, it just, there's no need to buy new things when there's plenty of unused things that need uses, you know? And it just kind of like, like cradles the sustainability aspect of all of my work. So I just do a nice little bloop on that one. This one. You know, if you're like having family over, I like when I'm doing banquet style, I do it awkwardly out on here. And I, I kind of hate uniformity, unlike a lot of chefs, you know, because nature is not uniform. There's nothing uniform about nature ever. If nature wanted plants to be perfect cubes, then the plants would already be perfect cubes, you know? Uh, so I just love, I love being able to see exactly what things are. So here I've given you two ways to play. We got a little pseudo quenelle here, which is just like a nice little spoonful and then spread across the plate. And so I usually serve it. These right here are pop beef tendons. And so it's the tendon that you find within the beef, uh, like within the back foot and then some of the shoulder. So it gets simmered, simmered, frozen, sliced, popped. You're gonna have a hard time finding that. So like a lot of times I use pork rinds or crackers or crudités, like raw vegetables. And I got some of those already done right here as well. You know, a lot of times I'll take just like a few radishes and I love top on. 
because that green is so delicious. And again, we can do it even with this in, this one. So now you can use that raw fresh veg to scoop up everything you need. We'll go with this one first. So I like to go on now that that's all mixed up. We're done with that. And so I'm gonna bust out the pickle tray because I love pickling. Again, that's a great way to minimize waste, you know, whether you're at home or in a restaurant. <clears throat> so here I have, this is olive oil that actually was grown and pressed here in Georgia in the Southeastern United States. One of the only places that does that. So I go, I love olive oil, I, I could drink it. So we'll go olive oil down, a little more texture with some crispy garlic. And then just a little bit of these mustards right there. And you can just leave a little spot of them or you can do multiple spots like doop, doop. there, here all over this one, that. And then my different pickles. So here I have, these are watermelon rinds, but almost any melon that you clean up, you can take the, the, the hard part that's between the flesh and the skin. And it actually pickles up really nicely. It has real nice texture, uh, very representative of the veg itself. And a lot of times it doesn't have much flavor. So it's, it's great to use in like sautés, you know, stir fries, things like that. We'll throw some of those on there. This is some bread and butter squash. So it's just a, like a sweet pickled squash. So, and then here's some fermented green beans to go across and around. I like to slice them in half sometimes and you can see that cross cut interior is really attractive. Um, sour corn. Uh, these are carrots that I've fermented in beet juice. So like even after I'm done fermenting some, something, I take that liquid and use it again and again and again because it's so full of the lactobacillus and the organisms that we need to turn our product into amazing old world style pickles. And then I finish it all with a little bit of flaky sea salt. Boop, boop, boop. We can go on this one. This one, I just give them a little side, but you see how it's kind of fun and interactive. Nice. Let's go here. Boop. And here's our crudités. So, you know, crudité is just a raw vegetable, but that's what I love about it. It's like the truest expression of a vegetable, you know? So we got our little crudités. We'll throw them over the top of this one. And again, these crudité are the kind of thing you can use for like a vegan form of the dish. There we go. And you see how it just kind of drags artfully across everything. And it adds a nice little crisp texture. If we want parsley's, whatever herbs you have on hand. I like dill, parsley, and cilantro are probably my three favorites, but tarragon's amazing. Always chives and scallions, of course. I'm an onion head. And then sort of now I can move that. So here is, here's basically like a flattened out version of the dish, kind of hard to see. Okay, I got it. And then here is just like your like party style, you know, and it's hidden. I love, I love building a dish where the main component is hidden and like, it's just that great surprise. You know where it is, but you know, you don't have to stare at it to know, like, I, I don't know. I just love surprise dishes like that. This is amazing and it's so beautiful. Okay, so I have two questions. This first one is, would you please reveal to us your simple pickle? Because I have recently gotten into loving absolutely anything pickled, especially uh -huh. the green string beans that when you bite it, that vinegar kind of explodes. You really have to, yeah. you really have to like that, but I'm a fan. So what are, I think it's pretty easy, but what is kind of your classic pickle brine that you can use for anything? I mean, I always do 
I do about 60% sugar. So let's just say, let's say we're going with, it's hard because I do in such high volume that it's hard for me to like, I mean, okay. I usually do five <laughs> gallons of vinegar, three ciders, two wow. distilled, three gallons of water. But so I basically, I, I, let's just, I, I think off the top of my head, I can think one up, probably a quart of vinegar. And it's nice because it doesn't go bad, you know? So a quart of vinegar would go with like a cup of sugar, half a cup of salt. And then from my aromatics, I always like to use fresh thyme, never dried uh, coriander, like dried coriander, uh, black peppercorns, chili flakes. And sometimes I go heavier on the chili flakes. I stay away from the winter spice personally. Like, you know, I don't, I don't do like cinnamon or clove or anise, uh, a lot of those things that I'll, a lot do, unless I'm going for that specific flavor. For, but for my base pickle, I, and I always use brown sugar, sorry. One cup brown sugar, half cup salt, one quart vinegar, let's say a pint of water. Uh, and then the aromatics, I just said, uh, fresh thyme, probably for that much, I'd do like maybe eight sprigs, uh, a tablespoon of chili flakes, a tablespoon of mustard seeds, a tablespoon of coriander seeds, a tablespoon of black pepper whole. And bring it up and then just pour it right over. Okay, and you pour it right over while it's hot. I do it while it's hot, yes. I mean, I, I okay. will do, it, it does work cold, but it just takes a few days where, you know, right. and, and so for like soft things, like, like for tomatoes, always cold, you know, because I love, I love to like okay. poke a few holes in a little cherry tomato or a grape tomato and pickle that, you know, or a little whole pepper, there's little tiny pekins or so, you know, and then poke a few holes in them and pour the cold liquid over and then just give it a few days to a week. Wow. Okay, well, this is the pickle recipe of the century. I've written it down. So <laughs> this is fantastic. Thank you so, so, so much for this demo. You guys are amazing. We have been doing this for 55 minutes. I mean, I'm just thoroughly impressed by all of you to stay in a time like that. Honestly, amazing. Thank you so much for your demonstration. Uh, is there anything else that you, Maite or Pri, want to add? Any comments? I mean, I'm grateful. <laughs> yeah, I can just say something. Oh, sorry, sorry. Amazing for the recipe. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say, because we had this little discussion about can we compost meat? And uh, so I think it's good to put it on the table a little bit, what, uh, what you could do with the meat. I mean, if you don't finish all this amazing uh, dish, and you still have a little bit of like meat left over, or even some bones left, left over, one safe space that you can put it, it could be your worm bin. I mean, not to put the entire heart inside because they will have quite some trouble to chew it as uh, thinking that the worms don't have teeth, but little bits of meat, and uh, if you bury them inside, they can deal with that. Basically, the problem out of the meat is yes, it releases a little bit more smell than the composting of vegetables and fruits. So then if they are made, like if they are a bit more exposed in an open area, it can attract some different uh, sort of pests attracted by that smell. But if you put a small quantities and you bury deep inside into your uh, box of worms, you might, if, unless you really dig it up, you won't really feel any smell. And like in a few weeks, it will just be nice vermicompost. On top of that, meat like has a lot of like a proteins. And proteins is a source of nitrogen as well for our soils. So in a way, you're really making even more nutritious uh, sort of like castings out of the worms. So you can put them inside. And then for the bones, the worms will not eat the bones, but they will really get them very, very, very clean. So any sort of leftover that is there, they will process it. And you can always, when you are cleaning up your worm bin, you can put them on the side. And with some just chopping, you know, like with a little hammer or something, you can bait it down to powder. And that you can sprinkle in your garden as well, because it's also a very good source of like uh, potassium and phosphorus that your plants and your like uh, flowers will really enjoy. So yeah, at the end of the day, anything remaining that nobody wants to eat can go to the system quite fast. Incredible. Thank you so much, Maite. And that's definitely something that 
that we were wondering is, is how to compost anything that uh, Stephen leaves left over, which is basically nothing. So it's a challenge to find anything to compost after Stephen cooks, which is a very high compliment. Absolutely incredible what you do. Um, one last quick question for you, Maite. So first of all, it seems like if I start composting on my balcony, it's not going to smell as long as I do the layers, which is great news for me if I do it correctly. Hopefully, I'll let you know how that goes. And what is the deal with eggshells? People say they don't decompose. What's the story on the eggshells? I have to know. Well, the eggshells are mainly carbon, I mean, <laughs> calcium carbonate. It really is like calcium, calcium that is also needed for your soil. So myself, what I do is just I rinse them off. So to remove any sort of leftover of the egg itself, that if then the composite will also smell a little bit not very good. So I rinse them off and I just crush them. And I put them either in my compost or in my worm bin. In the worm bin, the doodos, the worms, they like to have a little bit more of grip when they are eating. So that facilitates a little bit even to pass through their intestine. So that helps. And then on top of that, calcium is good for your plants. Like one of the micronutrients is calcium. So at the end of the day, you are just bringing it back easier. It won't compost per se, but it will start dissolving it's as water is passing through. And there is a little bit more of an acidic environment. This calcium is little by little going inside of the soil in a better way. So yeah, you can put them. I mean, you have to also then understand which plants you have. If they really want a lot of like a calcium or not, so then you might dose it. But by default, unless you are really an egg, egg eater, so it should be okay. Amazing. Okay, this is good to know. Uh, this is absolutely incredible. I really thank you all so much.